Noir Alley is back from summer vacation. I'm your rested and refreshed host, Eddie Muller. I hope you enjoyed Summer Under the Stars. We're getting things restarted with a pair of unlikely co-stars. Claudette Colbert and Robert Ryan star in the 1950 RKO release, The Secret Fury. It was part of a wave of thrillers exploiting the culture's newfound fascination with repressed memories and amnesia which in Hollywood was spurred by artists' interest in psychoanalysis. Hitchcock's Spellbound led the way in 1945, and films like High Wall, The Locket, Shock, Possessed, The Dark Past, Manhandled, and Whirlpool, among many others, all featured variations on a locked room mystery, only with the locked room being the human mind. In The Secret Fury, Colbert and Ryan's wedding ceremony is interrupted by a stranger who declares Colbert's already married to another man, something you think she might have mentioned. The bride and groom have to track down this mystery man to prove it's all just a terrible mistake. Or maybe Colbert has lost part of her mind. That's the setup. Harris-born Claudette Colbert was a huge star, especially in the 30s, anchoring dramatic epics like Cecil B. DeMille's Sign of the Cross and Cleopatra, and displaying impeccable wit, charm, and timing in classics like It Happened One Night and The Palm Beach Story. Although noir was definitely not her métier, Colbert had just done one very similar to this, Sleep My Love, made in 1948 by Mary Pickford's Triangle Productions. One more example of how the film noir movement pulled in even the unlikeliest of producers and performers. The project was originally intended for Ida Lupino, but by this time her interest had turned to producing and directing movies, not merely acting in them. Claudette Colbert was also delving into the production side of the business. She was the silent producer of this film, along with the credited Jack Skirball, a former rabbi turned producer. They were partners in Loring Theatre Corporation, which made the film in association with RKO. Colbert agreed to star on the condition it be directed by her friend and colleague, Mel Ferrer. Although he's mainly known today as an actor, Ferrer was initially signed by Columbia in 1944 as a director in training, although his stage acting experience brought him work mainly as a dialogue coach. His only directorial credit prior to this was the 1945 B, The Girl of the Limberlost. Although he did serve as John Ford's assistant director, on the 1947 film, The Fugitive. Thanks to Colbert, Ferrer finally got a directing credit on a prestige picture. The Secret Fury is based on an original story called The Wind is Blind by James O'Hanlon and Jack Leonard, who'd worked primarily on comedies and musicals. The screenplay is by Lionel Hauser, whose most memorable credit was as a co-writer on 1945's Christmas in Connecticut. While The Secret Fury has a compelling premise, the script veers toward the preposterous, especially when it gets to the courtroom scenes. But I give credit to Mel Ferrer. He directs the hell out of this thing, using odd staging and visual quirkiness to plow through egregious plot holes. Unlike most of the people involved, Robert Ryan was a fixture in film noir. His Oscar-nominated performance in 1947's Crossfire ignited his career, but threatened to typecast him in menacing, malevolent parts, like he played an act of violence and caught. Here, Ryan is charming and gallant, but because he's Robert Ryan, you're never too sure about his motivations. His presence alone gives the film an extra level of ambiguity and suspense. The supporting cast features writer-actress Jane Cowell, ex-con actor Paul Kelly, and everybody's favorite next-door neighbor, Vivian Vance, in her first credited film role. Here is The Secret Fury. Okay, please do me a favor. Go right to the Noir Alley Facebook page or Twitter feed, and if you can, explain to me what the hell just happened. What started out as another in the ubiquitous subgenre of amnesia plots 
gives way to yet another in the equally ubiquitous subgenre of gaslighting plots. Only for the life of me, I can't fathom the absurd resolution. It's always a challenge for a mystery writer to keep the culprit hidden in plain sight, but the motivation concocted for scheming lawyer Gregory Kent doesn't hold an ounce of water. He implores Ellen to shoot him so she'll be put in an asylum, like he was, before he became a successful attorney and confidant to an affluent family. Come again? On second thought, don't even try explaining this mess. It'll make you as crazy as our crackpot culprit, and it could lead to having a mirror fall on you, which I guess we're supposed to assume killed the guy. Completely ridiculous. Which is not to say the movie isn't fun. As a director, Mel Ferrer shows a flair for unusual staging and clever bits of business. Of particular note is that weirdly dreamy hotel jam session, which plays like it might have been directed by David Lynch. I'm sure many of you noted the cameo by Jose Ferrer, who was no relation to Mel, even though Mel's father's name was Jose. But Jose and Mel were colleagues. Mel had directed Jose in the 1946 stage version of Cyrano de Bergerac, a role that Jose would recreate on film the same year he appeared in The Secret Fury. It had win him the Oscar for Best Actor at the 1951 Academy Awards. This film did virtually nothing for Mel Ferrer's directorial ambitions. RKO used him to direct additional scenes for troubled productions like Vendetta, The Racket, and Macau. But he wouldn't make another film until 1959 when he directed Green Mansions, starring his wife, Audrey Hepburn. They'd met in 1953 and were married after co-starring together in the 1954 stage play Undine, for which Hepburn won a Tony Award. They'd split up not long after Ferrer produced Hepburn's 1967 hit, Wait Until Dark. Now, the character in The Secret Fury who creeped me out the most was Dr. Roberts, played by veteran character actress Elizabeth Risden. The blithe arrogance of her presumptuous psychobabble is truly horrifying. But I will point out that the film makes accurate use of an electroencephalograph, right down to the Faraday cage Colbert is placed in to keep electromagnetic energy from interfering with her brain waves. It's good to know that in such a preposterous script, they bothered to get the scientific details right. It makes all the difference in the world. And here's a last bit of trivia for you. Phil Ober, last seen being crushed by a falling mirror, was married at this time to Vivian Vance, who played his accomplice, Leah, following year, she'd become known in virtually every American household, at least those with TVs, as Ethel Mertz, best friend of Lucy Ricardo on I Love Lucy. Vance would remain Lucille Ball's reliable comedic foil for the next 20 years. Next week, Henry Fonda and Vera Miles co-star in The Wrong Man, a true crime story from 1956 directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Lots of intriguing backstory to that one, so I hope you'll join me for it. Until then, see you in the shadows.